Good morning, everyone. Let's see if this, let's get this moving. Oh, that's okay. That's why I'm saying, that's why I'm saying good morning. <laughs> Tell me. Tell me. I can talk without it, but we're going to really talk with it for you. Hello, good morning. I'm just going to keep doing this until I'm oh. there myself. <laughs> Thanks, Ellie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kendall Mazur, and I work here in the Stickman School for Architecture and Landscape Architecture. I serve both the Departments of Landscape Architecture and our Hamer Center for Community Design, and it's my pleasure to introduce Eliza Pennypacker, our department head, and she's going to provide our welcome remarks. Department head for Landscape Architecture. There we go. <laughs> this is way too formal. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's an absolute delight to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. As Kendall said, I'm Eliza Pennypacker. I'm head of the Department of Landscape Architecture, and I want to provide you just a few moments of context for this amazing event that we're having. So I'm going to start off by taking this much credit for the existence of E plus D. Here's what happened. Last fall, September of 2016, we, we had a little windfall of funding in our department. And rather than simply applying, let's say it was $10,000, I don't know. Rather than simply applying those funds to the inevitable, inevitable expenses, I decided, wouldn't it be fun to put out a call to the faculty for ideas, ideas that would help to make us even more impactful than we already were. So I said to the faculty, okay, have at it. Got lots of proposals, it was really great. And one proposal was submitted by the inimitable Andy Cole, who's sitting up here in the front. And Andy submitted a proposal for a thing that at the time he called CEDAR a Center for Ecological Design and Restoration. And in Andy's proposal, here's what he wrote. The center will provide a focus for the integration of the art of design and the science of ecology in addressing complex social and environmental problems. So, the department head advisory committee and I looked through all of the proposals and we decided that this one really had legs. So we funded it. And then Andy got additional funding from the College of Arts and Architecture and also from the Huck Institutes for the Life Sciences. And CEDAR was off and running. But then, CEDAR had to change names because we discovered, to our embarrassment, that Penn State already has a CEDAR. It happens to be a center focused on education, not ecology, but there you go. So as we were casting about for a new name for this enterprise, we were very aware of this publication. This is a book that was published in 2002 named Ecology and Design. Uh, it was edited by Bart Johnson at the University of Oregon and Christina Hill, one of our guests, who at the time was at the University of Washington, uh, the foreword was written by David Orr, who is also one of our guests. And this book uh, really documented a very important conference that had occurred in 1998 that we here at Penn State know as the Shire Conference. And that's because Ken Tamingo, one of our faculty, was a participant in that 1998 conference. And I kept hearing about the Shire Conference from Ken, the Shire Conference, the Shire. I didn't really know what it was, but I knew that it was incredibly important and a coming together of minds to do cool stuff. So, the name E plus D, Ecology plus Design, is a very intentional homage to that conference and to that publication of 2002, 15 years ago. At the time, in the publication, Robert Melnick, who was then the Dean of the School of Architecture and Allied Arts, wrote the following in the preface to the book. That the conference brought together a distinguished group of scholars and practitioners to first and foremost think about what it means to teach landscape ecology and landscape understanding in professional academic programs of landscape architecture 
Now what Robert didn't say, and I understand from Ken, and Christina, you can corroborate this if it's true, is that the convening was intentionally of fairly young faculty. The belief that young faculty would be the, are you nodding or not? Yeah, okay. You're, the steering committee was organized. Okay, the organizing steering committee, a group of young faculty with the belief that the young faculty are the future, which I think is incredibly cool. Yeah, what's not to love about that? But wait, there's more. Because Hill and Johnson compellingly stated in the book's introduction, whether these fields, meaning ecology and design, choose to learn from one another at this critical time, and whether they build collaborative approaches to land development and conservation, could have <coughs> impacts that resonate throughout this century. One thing is abundantly clear, they wrote, no single discipline possesses sufficient knowledge or skills to address the combined complexities of cultural and ecological issues across the diverse set of contexts and scales in which they occur. Well, that was 15 years ago, folks. And as far as I'm concerned, that was our charge. This symposium, the very first activity of our new center in development called E plus D, this symposium is intended as a test because the audience is the Penn State community. We've brought in amazing people from around the country to tell us about the benefits of this collaboration. This symposium is a test of the desire and the will of the Penn State community to make this happen. So we have our charge, and I would say it's time. And now in the immortal words, of Captain Jean-Luc Picard, with a slight variation, let's make it so. Thank you so much for being here. And now, Andy Culp. Again, I, I echo Eliza's comments. Thank you all for showing up, especially our guests, for agreeing to be here. It's uh, more than I could have hoped for, actually, when we began this effort a little over a year ago. Every now and then, once, about once a decade, I get a good idea. <laughs> it's turned into one, I think. Uh, but none of this would have been possible without the help of a whole lot of other people. And I want to call out a couple of those people here today before we begin. Uh, Scott Tucker and his crew for helping to design uh, our E plus D's, posters and logos. Can you call it a logo? Maybe not. Mark, whatever you call it. Um, Stephanie Smuggle Thomas. Stephanie's taking pictures and has helped in uh, promoting the symposium, Cody Goddard for, and his crew for, uh, you're being live streamed, by the way, on Facebook right now. Um, uh, Jane Dura Cowsmith for helping uh, with materials as well. And to me, first and foremost, the sort of the glue that has held all this together, and really the main reason that you're here is uh, Kendall Mazur for all the effort she's uh, put in over the last couple of months to help this get going. So. Uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate you being here, and I'm going to pass this off to Kendall to get us rolling. Thank you, Andy. Thank you all. And uh, if you don't want to hear from me, I think many of you in the room came to hear from our first group of speakers, which is why you got up so nice and early and joined us. Um, so to start us today, we're going to be welcoming Dr. David Orr. Dr. Orr is Paul Sears, Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies and, Pol and Politics Emeritus. That is quite a mouthful, sir. And Senior Advisor to the President of Oberlin College. He is a founding editor of the journal Solutions and founder of the Oberlin Project, a collaborative effort of the city of Oberlin, Oberlin College, and private and institutional partners to improve the resilience, prosperity, and sustainability of Oberlin. Orr is the author of eight books, including Dangerous Years, Climate Change, The Long Emergency, and The Way Forward, and Down to the Wire, Confronting Climate Collapse, and he's the co-editor of Three Others. In the past 25 years, he has served as a board member or advisor to eight foundations and on the boards of many organizations. Currently, he is a trustee of the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado and the Children of Nature Network. He has been awarded eight honorary degrees and a dozen other awards, including a Lenders Prize, a National Achievement Award from the National Wildlife Federation, and a Visionary Leadership Award from Second Nature. He is a frequent lecturer at colleges and universities throughout the world, so we are thrilled 
that he's picked us as one of them, and he's joining us today. Please help me welcome Dr. David Orr. Very nice to be here. I, I'm here with, uh, Lane and I are here with some trepidation because of the game on Saturday. So I want to be really clear. I grew up in Pennsylvania as a Penn State fan, okay? Y'all easy with that? So I was in agony. We came out of the movie theater after the game and found out uh, what the score was. So uh, I'm with y'all in, in greeting, but I can't say this in Ohio. Uh, hey, Dr. Turn your mic off. <laughs> well, I turned it on. Do you all want to hear what I have to say? You, you don't have to. You're on mute. Yeah. We don't want you muted. We want John. I was told to mute it when I came up here. <laughs> Is that, we get, are we, we, we get good? Yep. Okay. And this has, they said, the filter that will filter out uh, inane and stupid comments. So <laughs> that's when it goes on mute. Uh, Years ago, probably year, early 1990s, I uh, went to a conference on ecological design, the first time I really began to think about it. I had a big sur. I had people like John Lyle, the great the architect and landscape architect, and Paul Hawken, uh, uh, currently working on his drawdown project, and uh, John Todd, uh, known to many of you here, and uh, Sim Vanderrein, who really had begun the green design movement with his uh, work on the Bateson building in, San Francisco, or in uh, Sacramento. And uh, we sat around for three days and talked about what ecological design was about. And it was a remaking of the human presence on the planet. We tried the fossil fuel economic growth thing, and it hasn't worked out very well for us. And so uh, that, by the way, culminated in the founding of a journal called Solutions 20 years later. So the pace of change is nowhere near what the the circumstances call for. So uh, we find ourselves here, and what, what I want to do is uh, move fast and break things, as they say. Uh, I want to change a little bit or expand the focus uh, uh, for this event just uh, in, in several ways. We're here in the middle of three converging crises. One of those, of course, is the climate crisis. And it is not moving slowly. It's not something that's going to happen to us in 20 years or 50 years. It's here. It's now. We saw the results uh, with hurricanes and uh, tornadoes and wildfires and so forth in Florida and also uh, South Asia. But this is the new normal is that there's no normal. And it's happening much faster than anybody thought could possibly uh, occur even a few years ago. Uh, the second crisis is... Um, and the breakdown of the social consensus that bonds us together as, as Americans in democratic society. So if you, if you look at the poll data from the World Value Survey, for example, you find declining support. I don't mean a little bit. I mean precipitously declining support for democracy and a rising number of people who say military governance would be OK. And it's at all parts of the income spectrum. So you find uh, one in six now. It's said uh, in the high income group in American society, say they prefer military government to democracy. And that has gone way, way up. And there's a few percent uh, not long ago, now it's up to one, uh, one in six. And at the low end of uh, the spectrum, the same thing declining support for democracy. There's a third thing, and these are related. The third thing is uh, whatever your politics, and I really don't care to be left or right or Democrat or Republican, that's not the point of this. But you can't be very happy with the state of American democracy from any number of perspectives. And these are three converging crises, and they're related. So the question I'd like to ask here is, is what do we in, in this ecological design community have to say about those issues? Because if we don't have something to say, and better yet, something to do that is constructive, that helps to heal these three issues or resolve these crises, we're toast. And all our design projects, uh, all the ones I've worked on are basically building the hotel recently. I'll show you one picture of that. Uh, they don't matter. They will not matter one bit if climate change gets out of control or if we dissolve as a people. And the question is whether we are a people and whether we are now up to uh, governance of the people, by the people, for the people. Abraham Lincoln's work. That's the question that hangs before us. And so the issue for us in th this gathering and for uh, people in this ecological design community everywhere is what do we have to say about these issues now? And more importantly, what do we have to do about it? How does ecological design affect governance issues and economic issues? So I want to start there. 
So <clears throat> I'm proposing that we stretch the conversation about ecological design to include issues of governance. And I've used that word instead of politics deliberately. And governance is all the rules and regulations and so forth, including social norms by which we conduct our business. And the things that we don't do, not because there's a law against it, because it's just not right, it's not civil. And so this gets into misogyny, it gets into all kinds of other issues. We have to learn to come together as a people. So the question again for designers is how do we design settings and places and larger institutions and stretch to begin to think about politics and the design of the way we conduct the public business in a way that is uh, conducive to civility, charity, compassion, patriotism, and farsightedness. So that's, that's the challenge to us. If it's easy, it would have been done a long time ago. It's not easy. And then one, one note, the, the founding fathers, and they were all men, uh, the founding fathers thought of themselves as designers. And what they were doing was to take the new development of science, Newtonian physics and so forth, and begin to think the Newton's world, the, the world worked kind of like a big machine. So to take that machine and create governance systems that would, in, in their words, go of itself. It could just operate. Once you started the machine, like God created the universe, it just operated and you had these certain laws. So they were designers, and they were designing in that context. So the question for us, we now are armed with uh, the most important thing that happened in science. It had nothing to do with computers, uh, but, it, but it had a great deal to do with our capacity to see systems. So if you look for the most radical word in the English language, it is the word systems. Because it says you and I and the world and nature and the future and the past, we're all just one big system. We're evolving over time. But that's the most radical word, I think, in the English language. It says there's no way. There's, we're just all part of this, this thing, this system and evolving life and so forth. And you can't even make the distinction between the living part of the planet and what Wes Jackson, my friend, calls the ecosphere, the, the, what we think to be dead parts of the planet, rocks and geology and all that. It's just all one big evolving system. So I want to give some, uh, you know, 500 years ago yesterday, Martin Luther uh, tacked his uh, 95 theses to the uh, Wittenberg door, chapel door. And uh, I don't have 95 theses, uh, thank goodness, but I've got maybe 10 or 11. <laughs> so uh, let, me, let me list these. I'm going to read some of this. I mean, this is not good uh, for TED Talk style talks, but ecological design, as I understand it, our work, and those of you who are students, your work in the future, aims for the harmonious integration of systems and subsystems. Some are human. Some are, quote, natural systems. Both are nonlinear, which just means they're, they're surprising. They will behave in weird kind of uh, ways we can't predict and can't foresee. So foresight here is, is an important caveat, but th that puts design in this system context. This is all about systems. Now, we are not very good at, uh, I mean, systems are easy to talk about. They're devilishly hard to do. And so system science is one of these things that uh, the talk has always been way ahead of the, the actual performance when it comes to social systems. But design has to do with the integration of these two nonlinear systems, you and me and society and economies and politics, and then the way the natural world works. And so design is about the calibration of those. And when we get it right, uh, all our five senses are engaged. So it looks good, uh, the smell, the taste, the feel. In some senses, we, we don't know that we have, but we probably do have. Uh, they are all calibrated in what we design, our landscapes and our buildings. Number two. Good design, when we get it right, good design solves multiple problems by causing no new ones. So good design solves, in Wendell Berry's words, for pattern. It doesn't do one thing. If you do one thing, you're going to create habit. It solves for a pattern that is both natural and human. It tends toward resilience. Now, resilience is nobody's words that is hard to define. Uh, resilience and sustainability come together. I'll leave that for Q&A later. But resilience just means that the system has some bend to it. It can withstand disaster, whether human or natural or malice or, quote, acts of God, but the system doesn't break. Number three, oh, well, let me put also, when you get design right, we don't cross certain thresholds that are irrevocable and irretrievable. There's some things we don't do. And since human foresight is really limited, if you think back a couple of years and try to predict uh, the election of 2016, you could have predicted <laughs> what was known at that time, even a, a week before. But uh, we don't cross certain thresholds that are irretrievable, irrevocable. You know what I mean? Now, we're not set to do that. We, we are pedal to the metal kind of people. So 
if I ask you, let's do just an audience quiz. If I say, think of something that humans would not do, just name it. Would it not blow up the planet? No, no, no. That's our defense strategy. We have mutual assured destruction. Do we really care about our kids? No, no, no. Not, not because we, we put all kind of toxics and stuff out there and put them in front of television sets. No generation really loved their children would design systems that do that kind of thing. So we are, in terms of technology, if we can do it, we tend to do it. And then if you say, but you, you're in a conundrum, and I don't want to get into this, but if you say we ought to put limits on ingenuity, then you've got a real problem. Because book burning doesn't have a particularly happy history. How do you restrain human imagination? Or how do you redirect it? Tough problem. So I, I want to be agnostic on, on how you do that. Number three, there aren't many accidents in this world. What we find are the logical working out of the rules embedded in the system. Whether we understand the rules or not, those rules are there. So when you look at uh, uh, accidents, for example, climate change. Climate change isn't an anomaly. It may be an event that's a bit of an outlier, but it's not an anomaly. Climate change is the logical working out of a system of economic growth uh, prioritized and technological development powered by fossil fuels. There could have been no other outcome to that. So if I go down a list of the, the horror story, species extinction, same thing. The extinction of species is a result of just the working out of the rules of the system. Prioritize humans or a certain generation of humans and humans who tend to be white and of particular background and living in particular places and you get species extinction. So you, you put these things together, it's the logical working out of the rules of the system. Number four. Now, this poses a question for us. And a question uh, will test your politics, your morality, your ethics, and, and your, certainly your ingenuity and intellect. The question is whether the answer to those crises is also embedded in the system. I want to explain. When Thomas Jefferson, in the writing at the uh, hotel room in Philadelphia in 1776, penned the words, all men are created equal, he didn't have a clue what he had just said, I think. Because what then, then you can say, well, why women? And then why not the people of uh, present servitude, the slaves at the time? And why not Native Americans? And why not future generations? That was, those were words that were pregnant with all kinds of change. Now the point there is just very simply, we don't know how those changes occur. We do things that we just can't foresee. You, you make a change and all of a sudden you've changed a lot more than the thing you thought you were doing or the problem you were solving. So the question then is whether we need to create new systems, and again we're not very good at thinking about systems, uh, whether capitalism and uh, robust technology and a technologically adventuresome society can solve these problems. Are our solutions somehow embedded in this thing we call modernity? And I'm going to let uh, that question just hang. I want to pose the question, and I, it's beyond my intellect, but that's where we are. And so if you're an incrementalist, gradual changes occurring, then you're probably going to say, no, the system has uh, of education and the economy and so on. This will figure it out. These are all problems. They are not fundamentally dilemmas. Now, problems are solvable by definition. Dilemmas are not solvable by definition. You can maybe avoid them, but they are not solvable. Now, here's where going gets tough. All design, everything that we design is political. And all of you who work as architects or landscape architects or product designers or whatever you do, you're embedded in politics and you know this. You've got a new project you're going to do and you've got to go to the county uh, board of supervisors or some committee or somebody to get it approved. That's political. You find you run into their political viewpoints uh, pretty quickly. And then you've got to go get funding. Well, that, that's political. And then you've got to do all these other things. And so everything that we do affects politics. And politics is defined a long time ago by a guy named Harold Lastwell defined it as politics is about who gets what, when, and how. And if you're concerned about ecology, that means uh, land, air, water, uh, resources. Uh, fish out of the ocean, timber out of uh, the forest, and so forth. Everything is political in that sense. So design, when you're designing, you're not apolitical at all. You cannot be. And if you assume that you're apolitical, your politics are just the politics of the status quo. You follow what I'm saying? Everything we do in, the, in this design world, I think for a long time, and certainly when we were out at the Big Sur uh, 25 years ago, I think that we thought that this was just, just about stuff. It was designing systems that were powered by sunshine. That's a cool thing. <coughs> 
uh, no waste products, and that was John Todd, and that's a pretty cool thing, and so forth, but it was much more than that. This was when you take design to its logical conclusion, and the design of systems that live in harmony uh, with natural systems and human systems over long periods of time. Take whatever definition. That's a pretty radical thing. This is not non-political. Now, uh, number six. We work then within a system that is fundamentally political. And I don't know exactly what your curriculum is here, but I'm not aware of any design curriculum in any school in the United States, leave Europe out for a moment, but uh, that has a course embedded in the curriculum you have to take on the politics of design. There it may be such a course. I haven't seen it or heard of it. Now, uh, this means that uh, my seventh, I'm up to seven now. Uh, the seventh point here is that system design really is a challenge. And this is where we fail. So if we try to take this word design, uh, ecological design, two words, up to scale, then we have to begin to think about how these things mesh at higher and higher levels of complexity and difficulty. And so if you think about this, how do we extend the time horizon? Good design says it's not about today. It's about how this thing that we're designing and working on uh, behaves over long periods of time. So now we have to begin to deal with tough issues like our economic predilection for discounting. And discounting is simply the practice of saying, uh, of, of uh, managing investments so that a current investment is much more important than future investments. A disaster 50 years out is discounted back to net present value to almost nothing. So if I discount climate change, uh, an irretrievable disaster measured in, uh, say, trillions of dollars back to net present value, its current value, you, you know, it's, it's, you know, a few dollars. Secondly, we'd have to begin to think about accounting and full cost. If we had to pay the full cost of what we had designed and built over the past 50 years, we probably wouldn't have done a lot of it. We, but we don't do full cost accounting. And then rights. If we said we want to be a democracy, we think we're, we live in a democracy uh, under some dispute. But if we lived in an intergenerational democracy, there could be a lot more, presumably, of people in the future than there are alive today. You follow what I'm saying? If they get a vote, if you say, okay, all the billions and billions of people are going to live in the future, they get a vote. We'll have to give them some say in what we do now in this generation. There's some things that they, they would not want us to do. So how do we account for them? Well, we, we do this with people who are, say, retarded or uh, mentally damaged. and some, we, we appoint guardians for them. Why not guardians for the future? And give the future some say, even though we don't know precisely what they would prefer. And then there's this issue of restraint and precaution. How do we build into this system some break, some way to say, we're not going to do that. We're about to go across a threshold of artificial intelligence. And Norbert Wiener, a great mathematician in 1948, said when we do that, these systems will acquire something that looks a lot like sentience. They will think. And he says every degree of freedom we grant them is going to create a problem for us. And he said, we have, quote, no reason to believe that these machines will be kindly disposed toward us. They will have their own kind of intelligence, and they'll be much smarter than we are. So we're about to cross that threshold with no debate, as far as I can see. Very little debate, for example. So is there some way to put a break on this system? Now, um, that means we are uh, trying to create systems that have those characteristics, but we could design other ones. We could design, and I think this fact is the default setting, we could define, design a solar-powered, hyper-efficient, sustainable, somewhat resilient, fascist society. You get what I'm saying? There's nothing about fascism that would say we shouldn't design this. I mean, fascism could be solar-powered. It could be efficient, hyper-efficient. Germany certainly was in the 30s. Uh, it could be resilient and probably in some fashion or other sustainable. Do you follow what I'm saying? So this gets us, you do or don't? <laughs> that makes sense? Let me see a show of hands. How many, does that make sense? How many does say it doesn't make any sense at all, you're all wrong? <laughs> There's nothing in the act of ecological design that is necessarily democratic and about uh, you know, kumbaya and love between humans. Not at all. Design is neutral. Uh, Natasha Scholl's book, Addiction by Design, and I recommend it, describes how 
casinos design their machines that you gamble at. I've never been in casinos. So I don't know what this is all about. But they're designed so that they create addiction. And people will quite literally stay at a, a gambling machine until they've spent all their money. They will stay there. They will defecate. There are literally cases where people have died right beside them, and they continue to stay there and gamble. The designers are so good at addiction. And in computer systems, it's, it's said that for everybody on this side of the screen, there are a 1,000 people on that side of the screen trying to keep you at that side of the screen. <coughs> addiction. Addiction by design. That's design. And it's only the best design that makes us addicts. And that's the point of it. So now we live in the age of consequences, a phrase that Robert <coughs> Louis Stevenson spoke years ago. In equity, you could put eight people. Uh, they would fit easily here in the front row. Eight people on the planet have more net wealth than the bottom 3.7 billion people, eight people. More net wealth than the bottom half of humanity. In the United States, it's not much different either. So we have this enormous and growing inequity uh, problem. We have a public increasingly ignorant. In this scientific age, the age of information and so forth, we're proud to say all that, but a substantial part of the public is highly ignorant. Let me mention some family members. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't take that off the film. Um, and then climate change. And again, climate change is not something that's going to happen to us. It is already happening. So the storms that hit Houston and Florida and so forth, uh, and the wildfires in California, that's not how it's going to be. That's only how it is at the start. It's going to get worse. And then our politics, uh, corrupt politics, these are all design issues. And time, I wish we had time to take a leisurely path to solutions. We don't have that time. Time is not our friend now. And whether on any of these issues, whether it's climate change or our democracy and so forth, now we have to move very quickly. So it poses the questions, and this is my question to all of you. How am I doing time-wise? You got three minutes? Keep going. <laughs> she waved me away, so I've got, I've got to go now. <laughs> got to have the big hook. All right, here, here are the questions. Uh, what do we have to say about these issues as designers? So if we keep our design at the level, and this is where I've worked, so this is not a pejorative comment at all. If we keep our design work at the level of only landscapes and buildings, uh, we'll fail. The big numbers are running against us. So can we take design to scale where we're beginning to talk about the large political and social and economic systems? How are they, how, how should they be designed ecologically? So let's talk about economies that fit within natural systems. What does that economy look like? And fortunately, there's a lot of good work on this. Herman Daly has been writing about steady state economics since the early 1970s. Before him, Nicholas Georgescu Rogan. We know how those economies have to be structured. Uh, difficult to get there, perhaps, but we know something about those economies. The whole field of ecological economics and ecological design, and Bill Mitch is here somewhere in the audience. We know how those things work. We're not ignorant of these things. Um, how about information and education systems? What would ecological design say about the place we call the school, the artifact, the physical artifact, and the curriculum? What should people know when they graduate from Penn State or from the local high school or grade school for that matter? What should they know? How do you design education systems so people have a good BS detector? They can tell it when they hear it. They can detect it when they see it. Number three, how about energy systems that don't change climate? And here the news is, is really, frankly, very good. If you say to a uh, variety of people, Amory Levin's on, you know, thousands of people, some in this room, we want to design this community or this campus, this community, or the state of Pennsylvania to operate with no net carbon emissions. That could be done. It would take a couple of decades, but it could be done. We, the know-how is there. The technology is there. And then governance systems. <coughs> How would you recalibrate? Imagine yourselves in the room in Philadelphia in 1789 now, and you're, you're charged with writing a constitution for this fledgling thing called the United States, but you know what we know in 2017. How would you rewrite the constitution as ecological designers? How would you charter corporations, knowing what we now do about how much power we gave to corporations to govern the flow of energy and materials and our own appetites and advertise? 
How would you actually do ecological design of the advertising industry? No lies. No lies. You've got to tell the ecological truth. Um, so uh, how would you design, and this gets to the last thing I want to say, robust democratic systems that include we, the people, to create governance for us and by us and for future generations. And while we're at it, all species. Why do we just say governance is all about humans? How about all life forms have something to be or something to say within the governance structure? So um, the question then is how do we start? But imagine an ecologically designed republic. Imagine that we took the design science that many of you have worked on and, and exercised and uh, implemented your work. We took that design science, the system science and the science of ecology, and that was the real scientific breakthrough. It was we're all in this together. Uh, there has been no other breakthrough scientifically that was more important than that, and yet it's always downplayed. We get so focused on our gadgetry. So how would you design an ecological republic with the goals of human betterment, Fairness, equity, uh, conviviality. We like each other. How would you design that society? Society where there wasn't any fake news. There were disputes about the science where they were legitimate. But no such thing as fake news, and no people who would accept fake news. They're very small. How would you begin to redesign that? What does our work have to do with all of this? Now, uh, I'm going to close with one comment, and then I want to show a couple slides. Uh, comment is this. If we don't begin to design ecologically, we are, I said earlier in this uh, talk, we're toast. We won't make it. We've got to begin to think about the context in which you design landscapes and houses and communities and, and urban centers and how that begins to work. This has to be taken to scale. And so we, if we don't take it to scale, and there are a couple of ways to do this. I, I'm sure uh, most of them are beyond my, uh, uh, my can, but there are ways to do this. One is to make the assumption that if we do enough little projects, it'll all begin to rise, and that's, that's not a bad way to view it. It's incrementalism. But how do we begin to rethink the way these ought to be embedded in our laws, and institutions, and so forth? Now, um, let, me, let me show some slides here. Uh, th this, is, th this is the uh, what, do we <laughs> what do we do now part of the talk. I don't know what we do now. I will tell you, and, and this is candid, and this is uh, not off the record, but this is uh, uh, personal. After the election, I was dismayed. And I don't mean that as a Democratic or Republican comment. I'm not for, I'm not, this is not arguing for Hillary or Bernie or anybody else. This is an argument about the state of the way we conduct the public business. And you can't be a good conservative and be happy about that. You can't be a good liberal and be happy about that, regardless of who's in the White House. If Hillary had won with this kind of background, you, you could be upset. So wh what do we do? Uh, and here I want to propose something like a, a marriage between ecological design, the work of all of us, and this system of uh, democracy and governance. So here's what, here's what we're doing. Uh, this is the uh, uh, first event coming up is in Oberlin. Uh, Kendall, thank you. Uh, two minutes left? Sure. Um, this is, a, so we organized a basically a, a conference on uh, uh, the state of American democracy. And it's not left or right. We're not trying to be Republican or Democrat. I've got Paul Volcker's uh, uh, Volcker Alliance, hardcore Republican, uh, former head of the Fed. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, former governor of California, is a uh, Republican. Uh, they're both co-sponsors along with lots of other Republican speakers. Pete Weiner from the uh, New York Times is one of my uh, speakers and so forth. So we've tried to say this is not about left or right. This is about how we conduct the public business. So people say, well, gee, this looks like it's so democratic. No, 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 no. Imagine a football game where there are no rules and no referees. And teams show up with uh, you know, Uzis and hand grenades. Have a nice day. That's what American politics has become. And that's why we can't solve things like climate change or inequity. There are good Republicans that want to solve issues of equity and climate change. Where are they now? Uh, good Democrats. The, these, these pass beyond our, our political uh, affiliations. So this is the first event. Uh, this is our hotel. We, we just, uh, uh, I think when I was here last time, I referred to the old Oberlin Inn that we 
uh, place this. It was all torn down. It was the ugliest hotel in the Western Hemisphere. It had won awards for ugliness. <laughs> and uh, uh, my boss at that time was the president of the college who was a lawyer. And uh, I mentioned casually but seriously that the old Oberlin Inn, I'm not going to show you pictures of it, it's, it's, you'd run screaming out of the room. Uh, <laughs> But the old Oberlin Inn was a plausible excuse for limited nuclear war. I mean, not full, <laughs> full I mean, not a Kim Jong-un kind of event, but a limited nuclear war. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, David, don't ever say that again. The good lawyer popped out in him. So I never said that again. <laughs> Th this is the new hotel. Uh, it is uh, platinum rated. It is powered by a, uh, an off-site solar array. And uh, Ohio, more so than in Pennsylvania, is uh, a state where sunshine's kind of a theory. Um, <laughs> we, we've heard about it, don't get me wrong. But this is a solar powered hotel, and we built in this a conference center here. For the college, the question was what do we, as a college, uh, with a proud history of being the first college to accept African Americans and women and graduate them and so forth way back in the 1830s, what do we have to say about these issues now? So, Conference center, this is the hotel part, uh, and anyway, th this is where the event, the first event will be held. This was a conference we did last uh, year on the state of the American economy after fossil fuels, and so that's Arnold Schwarzenegger here, Mike Duffy from uh, Time Warner, he's just left, and Tom Steyer, the California billionaire. But for three days, we held forth on uh, the economy. That seems like a million years ago. I mean, that was a, a different America. So this is the, uh, these are some of our co-sponsors. Uh, there are 25 co-sponsors. There are some Republican organizations and Democratic and non-political organizations. Uh, these are some of the people who will be at the first gathering. Uh, and these are uh, pretty much headline people. There are about 35 people that will be panelists or participants uh, from CNN, New York Times, uh, all of the writers and uh, educators and so forth. Again, not Democratic, not Republican but trying to figure out how we start a national dialogue on the state of American democracy. Nobody, from whatever political perspective, can be very happy with that, that condition. So these are some of the people. Um, and we want to take this, uh, there will be four other meetings. Uh, the next up will be in Denver, where our focus is gonna be on the red-blue divide. Why are we so divided between rural America and urban America and so forth? And so we use uh, Colorado as a case study. The third meeting will be on voting rights and gerrymandering at the Schwarzenegger Institute in uh, Los Angeles in Southern California. Uh, fourth gathering will be on the future of the presidency. Uh, that'll be in Atlanta, sponsored by the Carter Center. Uh, we want to do a fifth meeting in Montgomery, Alabama on race and democracy. Um, and then I'm thinking, why not do a sixth or seventh event on ecological design and the future of democracy. Design in cities, and design as a way to begin to rethink what this country is all about. How do we build our values and our governing institutions in ways that we're really proud of and work over the long term? That's the design challenge. Thank you all.